So we are wrapping up our sermon series, wait for it, Aggies, called Farmer's Fight. Woo! There we go. And I know it's coming. <laughs> series about horns. <laughs> and there's no good verses about horns in the Bible, so you're going to be sorry. But we're going to finish up our, our farmer's fight verse first. This whole idea was born out of a verse that talks about planting seeds of righteousness. Um, that, uh, And I continued with you that that was a better idea for 2024 than setting resolutions uh, because resolutions are grounded in our own ability and our own power to achieve them. There are ideas of changing things permanently that maybe can't permanently be changed. Uh, but instead, what we could focus on is planting seeds of righteousness and then really talking about how we as the farmer who planted that seed need to fight for it, to contend for it uh, in partnership with the Lord to see a fruit, to see a harvest in our lives, a spiritual harvest. The Bible says in Ephesians that for those who plant seeds of righteousness and do not grow weary, we'll see a harvest of righteousness. And so we finish today with um, maybe the most obvious seed we need to plant. We've talked about planting the seed of self-denial, of denying self and taking up our cross and following Christ. We talked about seeds of health, planting seeds of health. Those seem obvious, but uh, we talked about how God cares about you as a whole person. That we're not just planting seeds of physical health, but physical, emotional, spiritual, financial, relational health. And that there's work that you can do there. There's ways to measure that. Last week we talked about planting a seed of Christ-like attitude. That the type of attitude you cultivate, the seed of attitude you plant, changes your outlook in on life, on the world. Like, literally, the way you wake up in the morning and decide to start your day has a lot to do with how your day goes. And so we talked about planting seeds of attitude. Today we're going to finish by talking about planting seeds of spiritual disciplines. Planting seeds of spiritual discipline. Now, what do I mean when I say spiritual discipline? There are five I'm going to mention this morning, and we're going to come back to them when we get to opposition. But I'll just tell you what they are briefly. They are reading God's Word. Discipline number one is reading your Bible. Discipline number two, prayer. These aren't rocket science. If I was going to tell you, like, what the, you'd be like, well, I bet the Bible and prayer have something to do with spiritual disciplines, right? Prayer. Number three, one that maybe fewer of us are familiar with, fasting. The discipline of fasting. <coughs> number four, the one you're doing right now, worship. The discipline of worship. And number five, journaling and or meditation. Now, those are the five primary spiritual disciplines. There's some folks who write about more and get a little more complicated than that, but I like to keep it simple. That's pretty simple. Read your Bible, pray, fast, worship, and journal about that, write about it, dwell on it, meditate on it. The scriptures say that when we dwell on the, the, the word of the Lord and we meditate on it, it's like honey to us, okay? So there's something to that. There's something to constantly thinking about it and not just, well, I read my 30 seconds of it and I'm done. But dwelling on it is something that matters too. Now, what is um, the soil in which we will plant the seed of spiritual discipline? And that soil is very simple, and maybe the most, uh, okay, but it is the soil of daily, repetitive life. In the mundane existence of life, these seeds must be planted. There's a famous quote that says that if God is not the God of the mundane, then he is no God at all. Why? Because God wants to be where you live. And all of us live in the mundane. There is something, maybe many things, you have to do daily, repetitively, that are not the most exciting things, not the most intriguing things. I do not particularly love that my dog requires I give him chicken every morning 
when I wake up to feed him. He's got to go to the bathroom, then he gets a creamy, then he gets chicken, then maybe he has to go to the bathroom again because if he didn't go poop the first time, he's got to go back out. These are mundane tasks. Ones I wish I could train my children to do. But that's not the only mundane task. Filling the car up with gas when it's empty. Paying bills, right? There is a litany of mundane tasks. Washing dishes, for God's sake. Washing clothes. How many clothes can be dirty? A whole bunch. I swear you just put this away. I saw this. I folded this hoodie yesterday. And it's in the laundry already. It's probably not even dirt. Oh, God, it's dirty. I <laughs> saw so a smell test it there. All the dudes in the room know, know what's going on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's like all of college. Oh, it smells us. It's fine. Where it's class. <laughs> Wash laundry later. The soil we're going to plant these seeds in our daily repetitive life. So, if that's the case, how in the world do we take these acts of spiritual discipline and plant them in the mundane? It is in the name itself. It is by discipline. And there are really five steps to discipline. And instead of making you listen to me talk about it, I've brought a video about this to share today. I think discipline is something a lot of us want. We have goals we want to achieve, people we want to be strong for, and more things we want to do in life. But sometimes we are our own worst enemy, and we get in the way of our plans maybe due to distractions, personal weaknesses, or struggles. So if you are someone that wants to grow in discipline and in spiritual strength, here are five steps to help you get there. Step number one, find a mentor. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In this passage, Jesus commands his disciples to go and make disciples and to baptize them. And it's important to note here that after Jesus made disciples, he commands his disciples to go out and make disciples. And the way Jesus made disciples was by spending time and living life with 12 men that he chose. And he hung out with them, answered their questions, and equipped them with knowledge and experience that they needed. So when it comes to being disciplined, you need to have a Jesus-like figure in your life who can equip you with what you need. For me, I've had five mentors in different chapters of my life. And whether it was hanging out at a coffee shop or at their home after a Bible study, these men poured hours of their time into me. And I learned how to serve in ministry. I learned steps on how to overcome sin, tips on how to be closer to God, and advice on how to teach. And because I hung out with them regularly, I saw firsthand what men of God should look like and how I ought to respond in love, strength, and humility. I honestly can't recommend this enough. If you are someone who wants to grow in discipline, Find someone who is capable of discipling you in the same way that Jesus discipled the 12. Some quick tips. If you're a guy, be discipled by a guy. And if you're a girl, be discipled by a girl. Also, pray for a mentor if you don't know who to go to. And look for someone who is spiritually more mature than you and possesses traits or characteristics that you admire. And if you're under 18, you need to communicate with your parents about how you meet with these people. But once you find someone... Humbly ask them if you can have coffee with them and if they'd be willing to disciple you and teach you how to be a man or woman of God. Step number two, find a team. Matthew chapter 10, verse one. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. In this passage, Jesus gave his 12 disciples an assignment to help people, and he gave them power to heal and to cast out demons. And please note here that Jesus didn't send his disciples alone, but they had each other to lean on. So it seems as if he wanted to give them the blessing of companionship. If you look at the night of Jesus' arrest and betrayal, despite the fact that Jesus' disciples ran away, hid, and acted fearful and cowardly, most of them still stayed together. And later in the book of Acts, you see that the disciples stood together through persecution and helped build Christ's church side by side. So once you find a mentor to pour into you, I would suggest that you also find other like-minded people who want what you want. Find people who also want to be closer to God, that want to serve in ministry, that want to break away from sin, and want to be better. Will you always succeed in your goals together? 
No, but if you're surrounded by people who keep trying to be better, soon you'll grow to be like them. And when it comes to the people you surround yourself with, please pay attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, which reads, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. In this passage, Paul warns the church not to fool themselves into thinking that they can hang out with evil company and not be affected. So if you want to grow in discipline, be very cautious of who you spend your time with. Some people will promote discipline, while others will tempt you to break it. So find a team. Look for people who have similar goals, perhaps even with people who are stronger and more dedicated than you, and build relationships with them. Because if you surround yourself with strong and disciplined people, in time, you will grow to be like them. Step number three, find a fight. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In this passage, Paul tells Timothy that he must go through hardship in the same way a soldier does. So the next important thing that you should do if you want to grow in spiritual discipline is to find a fight or a cause to take part in. Look, soldiers don't train for fun. They're supposed to train for something bigger than themselves. And good soldiers are willing to lay down their lives for the safety and protection of their family, friends, and their country. So if we're supposed to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, the question that I need to ask is, what do we fight for? I mean, yeah, we want spiritual discipline, but why? What are we gonna use it for? What do we believe in and what do we want to fight for? Because I'll tell you what, if you find a fight worth fighting that can make a difference in people's lives, you'll have a reason to be strong. And that reason will drive you to greater discipline. Step number four, find a habit. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. In this passage, we see that Jesus had the habit of separating himself from everyone and making it a point to pray despite his busy schedule. And here we have a small glimpse into what discipline looked like for Jesus. And the takeaway I see is to live like Jesus and to make it a point to regularly do something that would be spiritually uplifting in our life. So my suggestion is to find one habit that you believe that can encourage you in your walk with God and to keep trying to master that one habit until it becomes part of who you are. Maybe you make waking up earlier habit or having regular prayer walks or journaling, etc. I'd also add that some of the best habits to build are learning to have deeper prayer and having more in-depth studies of God's word. I would say that the focus though should be to make attempts to regularly do something that would be beneficial to you and to keep doing them until it becomes part of your daily routine. And once you get that one down, learn another habit. The idea is to regularly take small steps in a healthy direction so that one day, discipline just becomes something that you naturally do. Step number five, find a sacrifice. Matthew chapter five, verse 30. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. In this passage, Jesus presents an extreme idea, and it's to cut off your right hand if it causes you to sin. This passage, though, isn't meant to be taken literally, but it's an encouragement for his followers to take extreme actions to get rid of sin in their life. So if discipline is something that you want, you must find a habit to build, and at the same time, you must find a bad habit to get rid of. Discipline is more than just getting better at something, it's also a process of removing harmful habits or things that can get in the way of our progress. So I'd encourage you to identify what could possibly hurt your goals and to take steps to limit them or remove them entirely, okay? So if you're someone who wants more discipline in your life, Please consider these five steps. Find a mentor, a team, a fight, a habit, and a sacrifice. To close, be patient with yourself and your goals as you move towards greater discipline. I'd say it's important to have a marathon mentality, especially when it comes to the pursuit of greater godliness. So if things aren't progressing as fast as you'd like, keep going if you fall. Continue to take small steps. Rest in God's grace. And always remember, Jesus loves you. I think, dis I think discipline is something a lot of us want. We have goals we want to achieve. I think
discipline is something a lot of us want. Five steps that he mentioned, I'll touch on them briefly. Find a mentor. This is the fourth week of me talking to you about planting seeds. This is the fourth week I've said you need an accountability partner or a mentor. The, the idea here is, I hope it's sinking in, you cannot plant these seeds alone. You must be willing to be accountable and transparent with someone in a way in which they can build you up, point out flaws, talk to you about things that you maybe are blind spots to you, things that are highly uncomfortable. If we're honest, do I really want to meet with someone and say, you are so much smarter than me. Teach me all the things. And while you're at it, help me see some of my flaws and point them out to me regularly. This sounds like a good time. And even though it sounds counterintuitive, it might be the most important step we all need in order to make that progress. We need that insight from someone else. We need to find it someone who is ahead of us, like the video suggests, and we need to also think about when and where God will use you to be the someone who's ahead, to look back and be a mentor. Disciples who make disciples who make disciples. It's, it doesn't just, you don't just make one and say, did it, done. You make a disciple, someone's making you a better disciple. It's cyclical, it stays in process, and you are constantly looking for someone to mentor you, and for someone you can be a mentor Two, find a team. Number two, find a team. What did that sound like to you? What's our team? Say it with some enthusiasm. Church. church. You're on a team. You're on a team Hope Arise. Okay? But any church is basically a team. Finding like-minded people who want to do the things they were talking about is the church it's supposed to be. If you find a church that's not doing that stuff, then maybe it's not a very... Good church. But if you find a church that's full of like-minded people who are wanting to, to come together around the ideas of avoiding sin and being better and growing in grace, then you are in a, a like-minded place. You're on a team. Dive into that. Don't surround yourself with bad friends. Avoid bad friends. Right? The scriptures say this more than one place. The bad company corrupts. If you hang out with people long enough, what they are and who they are rubs off on you. And so if you're going to spend, let's just say, a couple hours a week with folks who don't share the same values, they're nice enough, but all the values don't line up, and, and it's okay, and you're going to spend no time with like-minded people, it's going to get out of whack. But if you're going to spend 10, 15, 20 hours a week with like-minded people, you can spend a couple hours with folks who don't think exactly the same for social reasons or because it's, it's you know, fun or whatever, and it's not really that bad, and, you know, then it's not going to be as big a, a pull on you because you still have this team you belong to where you're reinforcing your thoughts and your values, what God is saying to you. So your team really matters. Who you surround yourself with really matters. Find a fight, a cause to commit to. I love what he said here. It speaks to me as a dad a little bit. He said, if you find something you really believe in, then you will be committed to being stronger for it so that you can do it better, right? I really believe in, in raising my kids, right? So my discipline is centered around like, I have to do these things. I need to be stronger. I need to be better. I need to be more disciplined so that my father game is on point. Some things I don't believe in as strongly, I don't give as much time to, right? I do not believe I need to run any more marathons, so I have not been running. <laughs> right? My knees have told me, we do not do this anymore. But the truth is, like, if it really mattered to me, I'd be at the doctor. I'd be figuring out how to get that right. I'd be figuring out how to still train. I would be pouring energy into that if it was still a high priority, a cause I believed in. I would still be doing it. So I think it's important to identify what your fight is, what your causes are that you are. I would lay my life down for that. And so I'm going to give my energy and my strength there. I'm going to build it, that there. Find a habit. This is great. An easy habit. We might look at spiritual disciplines and go, I need to read the Bible more. Yes, you do. But then the, the next, find a sacrifice. Well, what's going to go away? My phone tells me I'm averaging seven hours a day on it. 
And I want to read my Bible more. I need to build a habit, and I need to find a sacrifice. These things can go together. Less time on my phone, more time in my Bible. Wow, look at all this time I apparently have to do that. Unless you're reading your phone, your Bible on your phone. Anyways. I'm aware that's a thing. Proud parent moment. I walked in last night. It's midnight. I'm like, I better go make sure the boys are asleep. And they're doing the Bible in a year. Their mother has inspired them to this. It is not me. I can't take any credit. And they're all going through it together. And I go in at midnight last night, and I can see the glow of phones as I approach the room. And I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to rip, right? Like, what's going on in here? We should be in bed. And it's the Bible, both of them, doing their Bible app. And I was like, like, so proud of Right? I mean, I went from like, I'm about to get them to dad of the year. <laughs> it's not me, though, at all. It's all them. And to do these five steps of discipline, I love what he said, and I'm going to say it a different way. He said, he said to be patient and allow yourself time to grow. Um, on Wednesday night at our budget meeting, our finance chair said something very helpful to me. He said, uh, this is a process, and we are maturing into it. And I thought, oh, that's good. Because we've been taking steps to grow some of our, you know, like best practices in our church council and how we're doing things. And he, he talked about it as a maturing process and that like it's okay to take baby steps in a maturing process. And I thought, oh, that's good. Because I, I judge myself like, have we reached this goal? No? Well, then we, we stink. But you never reach a goal here without taking this step and then this step and then this step. Right? It's a maturing process. And so... If you're looking at those five steps to discipline, you're like, ooh, I don't have any of that. It's okay. It's a maturing process. It takes time. And the, the appropriate um, response is to just take a step. You had that nice little graphic of the little figure going up the stairs a little step at a time. It is a maturing process. So our goal is we're going to uh, tend to our discipline by implementing these five steps Finding a mentor, finding a team, finding a cause, finding a habit, and finding a sacrifice. Now, here's what that looks like. In your life, you want to do the spiritual disciplines, right? Read the word, pray, fast, worship, journal. But something happens. This is where we're going to get participatory. I warmed you up for it earlier. You're ready to go. You're going to talk to me. I'm not going to tell you. Just tell me at first blush, what is the opponent in your life of reading the word every day? What keeps you from that? Someone just tell me. Time. Schedule, busyness, laziness, laziness <laughs> apathy. What else? Feeling tired. Feeling tired, yep. Distracted, Distracted? good. <clears throat> I wrote, the chief enemy of reading the word daily is a lack of discipline. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be the, the chief opponent of each of these, but specifically for reading the word, it's a lack of, it takes discipline to read the word. You know why? Because some of it is fascinating as all get out. It is like, wow, here's what I'm learning as I'm letting my boys go through the Bible in here. Vivian is not doing this because the Bible's PG-13 and R some places. And we've had some very interesting conversations as we're getting through Genesis. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, I forgot that's there. we got to talk about that. Oh, we've talked about that. Right? And so there's parts where are like, ooh, I don't really want to read that. I don't, I don't want to read the genealogies. I don't want to read about these issues. I don't want to read about the. I just want to get to the stuff that's like nice. That makes me feel good. And so it is. We avoid it. We're, we're busy. We're tired. Uh, we're lazy. It's a lack of discipline. If you're going to read God's Word daily, it's going to have to be by rugged discipline. You're going to have to set up like a, an alarm. Be like, whether I feel like it or not, I read God's Word when this alarm goes off. Whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to do this here. Whether I feel like it or not. I think the thing that's been beneficial, just and maybe we'll post the link for the, the tool that my family's using, is basically it's like you're on day 19 
You're on day 20. Oh, you're ahead. You're behind. You need to catch up. You need to, if you're going to get this thing done in a year, there's a measurement they can have there to see where they're at and pace themselves and understand how it's going. Um, so the discipline there is that they have to keep up in order to make it through the whole Bible in a year. Prayer. What keeps us from praying, church? What keeps you from praying? By discipline, what keeps it from you? Y'all remember? Like, I didn't make anybody wrong. Like, we all struggle with this stuff. It's okay. Like, just tell me what keeps you from praying. I feel like I would be complaining. Complaining? Oh, it feels wrong. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's that's good. What else? Schedule. Schedule, okay. Distractions. Distractions. Being tired, same thing. I wrote here, a lack of faith sometimes keeps us from praying. Mm -hmm. Because I pray a lot. I don't know that all my prayers get answered. I know they do. Theologically speaking, God answers every prayer perfectly, right? Like, whatever, whatever he answered was perfect. I just don't know if I understood it, liked it, got it, perceived it in real time. And so it's hard. It's like, well, if I pray, is anything going to happen, really? Right? I mean, and when we're going through the really big stuff, let's be honest, that's a part of it. Well, I prayed and you didn't take the cancer. I prayed and you didn't bring the healing. I prayed and they still got sick or they still died. I prayed and, see? And it eats away at our faith a little bit. Well, I don't know what he's doing up there anyway. Is it like, you know, Bruce Almighty where he hands reins over to some dude and he's falling behind on the prayer list? You know, like, what's going on anyway? I've been praying this prayer for months and I can't seem to get an answer. I mean, no one I want. Fasting. What keeps us from fasting? Hunger. hunger. Yeah, hungry. <laughs> hungry. Someone just said hungry like they're hungry right now. Hungry. <laughs> we talked about sandwiches earlier. It was a terrible setup for this one. Right? Hunger. Okay, what else? Medical issues. Medical issues. Oh, yeah. You're like, temptation is so easy. It's everywhere. Social situations. Okay. It does not sound fun. It, it, it sounds the least fun of all of them, for sure. And let's just, just by a show of hands, because this is going to be everybody, how many of you totally understand biblical fasting? Just raise your hand if you totally understand it. Yeah, it's, it's very few, right? How many of you feel like you don't understand it very well at all? Just raise your hand. Yeah, that's it. So that's what I put. The primary opponent of fasting is lack of understanding. You probably don't have a preacher who teaches about it enough. Right? There is some specifics to, to, to biblical fasting that are different from just avoiding food. The reason for it, the timeline of it, it's in the Bible, but we don't do it very much. Why? I hate fasting. So I don't talk about it a lot because I hate it. It's hard. I get hungry. I mean hungry, right? And it's, it's not, it's difficult and unpleasant. So sometimes it's just a lack of understanding that keeps us from fasting. We don't really understand why are we doing this anyway? Why am I depriving myself of something? Worship. What keeps you from worship? Now, worshiping is not just being in church, by the way. But what keeps you from worshiping? Like, anybody ever get at home and get, like, Alexa to play worship and just get lost in it for a minute? That's worship, right? But it doesn't happen all the time. What keeps us from that? Mood. Yep. I will feel like it right now. I don't even know if I like you right now, Jesus, or let some stuff happen in my life that I'm not crazy about. Why would I worship you? What else? Other priorities. Other priorities. Okay. I can't just sit here in my living room and get caught up in worship. I gotta go to work. I gotta pay some bills. Illness. Illness, yep. Illness. What else? This one's gonna sting, okay? And not if it hits home, don't be mad at me, it's the spirit. Lack of gratitude is our main opponent to worship. The ones who are really credited for worshiping in the scriptures worship when things are worst. David, when he's being chased in the desert, is worshiping God. You're like, I don't know that I'd be worshiping God. I'd be like, God, what's this about? You promised me some things and now the king is chasing me and I'm hiding in caves, eating insects and 
drinking water when I can find it. But he's worshiping, right? When David commits unfathomable sin and repents, he worships. Some of the places in the scriptures where worship is the most poignant are figures in which nothing is going right. Job. God has taken everything, or allowed, I'm sorry, let me get my theology correct, has allowed everything to be taken from Job. And Job still worships God. I don't know that I could do that. When I read Job's story, I'm like, yeah, if, if God allowed all that to happen to me, I'm pretty sure I'd do what his friend said, and which was to curse God and die. Like, let's just get this over with. It's too painful, it's too much. I can't. But Job understood, and Job is famous for this line, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't get to bless God for just receiving. God is the God who gets to do what God wants because God is God, and I, I bless God, I worship God because God is God, not because he gave, and not even because he took away, but because he's God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Journaling and meditation. What's our main point in here? Dwelling. If meditation is a tough word for you, if you're like, what are, you, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about some ancient Eastern stuff? We're not talking about that, are we? Like, no. We're not talking about chants and stuff, but dwelling on the word of the Lord intentionally and quiet, which could include journaling, but doesn't have to. What's our, what's our main opponent here? What, what keeps us from doing this? Distractions, yeah. It's difficult to know how. What else? Not making time. Yeah, you got to slow all the way down to do this. You got to slow all the way down, and everything else has to go away a little bit, right? But it can also be as simple as this: reading a verse in the morning and thinking, trying to think about how it applies all day long. Like, oh, that's like the verse this morning. Oh, that's like the verse this morning. Oh, look, in this situation, that's like that verse. That's also dwelling on the Lord. I put our main, our main uh, opposition to this discipline is really lack of practice. I feel like if we did it some and we got comfortable with it, it would, it would feel so simple and become secondary. But we don't have a, a lot of practice with this. First of all, in our culture, we don't do this. We don't slow down, we don't meditate, we don't journal. It's just not normal. Most people have to learn how to do these things. And so we don't have a practice of doing this. And so we're, maybe our main, main opponent there is lack of practice. So if we're going to apply these, these disciplines into our life, what is the measurement that we need to measure them by in order to know if we're starting to read the word, pray, fast, worship, and journal effectively? And they are quite simply this. Frequency, normalcy, habit. The more frequently we do it, the more normal it becomes, the more habitual it becomes. Uh, I have to, I give this example all the time, but I have to give credit. I get nervous. I don't ask my son if he remembered his phone in the morning because I'm worried about texting him later in the day. I'm nervous that we won't read the verse of the day because he's made it a habit in my car by his work, not mine. And I need it. I need it. My response has become amen when he reads the verse because it's good for my soul. It's become a habit. Not because not I did it, but because he did it. It was, we started to do it every day, had frequency, then it just became normal. It wasn't weird, like, I'm going to read the verse today. Oh, that's new. Huh? Okay. And then now it's a habit. Now, like, if, if, so he prays before he reads it. If he goes a little long, like, usually we've said it before this light, I get nervous inside. I'm like, I don't want to say, can you read the verse of the day? Because I don't want to be that, that dad. But I'm about to ask because I need my verse of the day. That's real. It's become a habit. So if you want these things to reach that level in your life, then they just have to increase in frequency. If you read the word every day, and, and then you stop, you'll be like, oh, I miss it. If you pray every day, or if you pray in, in certain situations, um, from the time my kids were little, I taught them to pray every time we passed first responders on scene. We prayed a very simple prayer. Dear Jesus, 
We love you. Please help the first responders to help whoever's hurt and help whoever's hurt to get to the hospital time. And as they go, keep them all safe. Amen. Now I just say, pray the prayer. And somebody in the car starts. Frequency, normalcy, habit. This is why things like the discipline of attending church matter. Because if we allow ourselves to fall out of our habit, right, then the way back is not impossible, but it takes time. It takes time to build back in frequency, normalcy, habit. And so we need to protect the things in our life that need to be habitual, right? Because that's how these things creep into the mundane. The example I'll leave is I read uh, an article online this week of a, a missionary's wife. They're in the Middle East. And she keeps the home. He's, the, he's a missionary and, the, and doing missionary things. I think they're having to teach like English as a second language to fly under the radar in the country they're in. They're not really supposed to be there as Christian missionaries. So it's like, well, I teach English as a second language, which is a cover for I'm trying to reach people for Jesus in the Muslim world, which that's okay. She said she was at her at the sink, um, and he he was guilty of a sin I am often guilty of. He put a cup in the sink that had like dried blueberries in it and just left it there. Didn't rinse it out, and they got dried up and crusty. And she says she goes to the sink to clean it, and she's cleaning it, and and he walks in the room and she start he, she just gives a big sigh. <sighs> kind of kiss the blue and he's like, oh, did I leave the blueberry cup out? And she's like, yes! Why are you so rude as to not rinse your cup? Don't you know that this is like extra work for me? And da, 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 da. And she said, right in the middle of that, and this is a silly example, but for her, this is what she wrote about. Right in the middle of that mundane task of washing dishes, what she does every day for the family as an act of service and of love, she's like, oh, crud. I'm supposed to be exuding the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines even in the mundane tasks of things like washing the dishes. And so when I read the word, which is a spiritual discipline, and it tells me that you love by serving, what I should be standing at these dishes doing is being like, thank you that I can show your love, Jesus, by serving my family in this very mundane and I don't like it very much task. And I sure wish I could train my husband to rinse out his cup but I'm not going to sigh about it because I'm going to love by serving in this task. I'm going to choose by discipline to do that. Now, I'm not saying that it was her job to do the dishes. That's how it is in their family, okay? This is not like, a, like whoever washes the dishes in your house, cool. And if it's me, and I do wash a lot of dishes in my house, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, ah, who left the spaghetti on the bowl? I'm missing the point just like she was missing the point. I can certainly ask them, hey, Help me out, rinse your dishes, please. But when they don't, what is my discipline here? How has my spiritual discipline met this mundane task in my life? When I take out the trash, do I say, well, is that all of it? Anybody got any more trash for dad to take out? Or do I say, hey, guys, anybody got, bring your trash down from upstairs. Dad's running trash. I'll take it for you. That's where my spiritual disciplines, where I've learned things like how to serve, how to love, right? Meet mundane tasks. And for us, that's what's going to have to happen. I think when the world sees that, when the world sees God's love in the mundane because we've applied our discipline to it, we've planted the seeds of spiritual discipline in the, in the everyday tasks of the mundane. I think that's what will change the world. I really do. The miraculous is cool, but every story of the miraculous in the scriptures, the people needed another miracle, right? We saw you rain fire in Egypt, but are you really there? If you are, strike this rock and make water come out. Okay, fine. Well, we saw the water thing, but, but we're hungry. And the, and the magic bread that falls is great, but could you send quail? Because we need protein. Then we'll know you're God. Well, okay, here's some quail. Well, we saw that. But if you could just make this city, the 
the walls fall down. Then, yes, this will be our sign. Okay. Well, we saw the city. I think the miraculous falls away too easily. I think God in the mundane is undeniable. I think Jesus knew this. I think it's one of the night in which he gave himself rest. He chose the mundane. He chose dinner. He chose bread and wine to show us. Right? There's nothing more mundane than having to cook dinner. Anybody else? Like, what's the dinner plan? I don't know. I don't want to cook. I don't want to think about cooking. But on the night in which Jesus gave himself for us, he took ordinary, mundane gifts of bread and of wine. And he said, take and eat this, all of you. This is my body given for you. And likewise, after he had taken the bread and broken it and blessed it, he took the cup. He poured it and he said, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, how often are we going to drink Wine, Jesus knew. Often. How often do we have to eat? Jesus knew. Often. As often as you eat and drink, do it in remembrance of me. I don't know that there's anything more mundane than the daily repetitive cycle of eating and drinking. And so we do. We give thanks before we eat. Where did that come from? It came from right here from this practice. And so be encouraged that even in simple gifts like bread and wine, this is juice by the way, anybody's worried? We find God by discipline because we do it repetitively with frequency, with normalcy, becomes our habit. So we ask that the Holy Spirit would come and make these ordinary mundane gifts of bread and of juice be for us like the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the best representation of Jesus in our world.